In this live classroom session, Steve explains to scuba instructors why and how to make diving skills demonstrations more relevant for today's learners. We're going to start with uh, skill demonstrations need to be much shorter than is usual. Okay. Now, I know that a lot of dive master courses are spent trying to make, um, trying to make demonstrations really lengthy and I don't know what words that people use. I don't know they, what words they use to, to demonstrate slow down and, yeah. and time, timely. yeah, in a, timely and, in a timely manner. It has to be a timely manner. Yeah. But we're gonna sort exaggerate. of <coughs> exaggerate. Yeah, that's, that's great. These words are good anyway. Timely and exaggerated still, still exist. But <coughs> sometimes uh, we, we need to, to work out how people learn skills, to be honest. Now, let me just give you an example now. If I was to teach you today to do a knot, maybe, that you've never seen before, you've never seen before. Now, what I'm gonna do is like explain how to do it, probably. Probably show you how to do it, and then let you have a go at doing it. Now, which one of those three do you think would be most effective? Me telling you how to tie a knot? No, okay. Do you think me showing you how might, it'll help to start with, providing it's quick enough? And then what happens? You're going to tie the knot. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if you actually get it right the first time? What, what would you then really like to do? Have, have another go. Have another go. Yeah. yeah. And then after that, Lots. perhaps have another go and then just keep practicing it. Now, if you think about anything that we've ever learned, driving a car, your drive instructor can talk to you as much as he likes. He can show you as much as he likes. But really, you need to have a go. Now, <clears throat> it's the same with any motor skill that we learn. So I'm now going to obviously refer it back to scuba diving. And I was at a dive centre fairly recently watching what was going on. And the instructor was really busy. Okay? The, instru the instructor spent a lot of time with a briefing, talking about a skill. He spent ages doing a demonstration. He had four students in the class. And he went to each student, and some of them had minor difficulties, but then they did the skill. And once they've done the skill once, what did he do? Went on to the yeah. next skill, and he did the next skill. And then when they'd mastered that, or done the skill once, or imitated the instructor, he went on to the next skill. So he had a busy hour in the pool. But if you look at it from the perspective of one of the students, each one of the students only had five minutes of exercise in that pool one hour. Can you see that? that that's like, it, it, from looking at it from that perspective, it's a bit scary because guess what? Those students were then deemed to be able to go to open water. Now this is happening in dive centers all around the world. This is happening. So what we're gonna try and do is to try and cut that, uh, make that five minutes half an hour. Okay, this is what we're going to try and do. Now, the way we're going to do that is that we really need to make an effective but short brief. Like if I was telling you how to tie a knot, if you're explaining to somebody how to clear a mask, for heaven's sake, they need to have a go, don't they? They won't ever know how to do it. What was you saying about Benjamin Franklin? You said... Yeah. Tell me, show me, involve me. Tell me, show me, involve me. And it's the involve me bit that gets missed out and yet we all know that it's the most important thing. Does it make sense this? Yeah. Okay, it does, doesn't it? And, and rings some bells as well, doesn't it? This, I mean, it, it's, you know, when we start looking at it like this, we think, well, yeah, it makes sense. So later on, I'm gonna be talking about um, brief briefings, but right now I'm gonna start talking about skill demonstrations. Now, just, Tell me, what is a demonstration for? Why do we do a demonstration in the first place? To show them. To show them what? To show them so skill. that what? So they can so they repeat it back to you. Yeah, so that they can do the skill. So we are showing them what to do, so how to do the skill. And we need to cut the time down because we just need to let them see how to, how to do these things. Now, I, I was talking yesterday about today's society. Today's society, we can only take four bits of information in our mind rather than seven because of the internet, because of smartphones, because of internet, uh, with inter um, what do they call it? Uh, I, sorry? IT content. IT content, that type of thing. We're being flooded with information and we just want to do things. We get so frustrated. I'm going to give you an example. Imagine you was in a strange town. You was in a strange town that, and you needed to get to the post office. 
and you didn't know how to get there. So you knew that you had to ask somebody. Now, what a lottery. Who are you going to pick to ask? Okay, we know this, don't we? Now, what we're hoping for is that somebody says, the post office, yeah. Third on the right, and it's on the left. That's what you want to hear, isn't it? How to get to the post office. What you don't want to hear is, oh, the post office, yeah, well, it's not that way. Yeah, you're, you're going in the right direction. You go down, um, now you go down past the first turning on the right, you see Barclays Bank. When you got Barclays Bank, you know, okay, you're on the right route, you need to go further than there. You might see McDonald's on the left-hand side, just keep walking, okay, keep walking. When you get to the next stop, you get HSBC Bank there. Now, don't go down that road. No, no, not that one, because that's not the one that you want to go to. What a nightmare. We know what we're talking about. We do know this, don't we? So you need to go further down and then, and, and then um, you know, when you get to the spa, you've gone too far, okay? You've gone too far, you need to come back and you go, to, but we know, don't we? We know this, don't we? Now, if we now relate that to a demonstration, can you imagine what some instructors are doing in front of their students? You know, they're giving far too much information and our brains can't take it. Now, if you think that a student has to learn maybe what, four or five skills in a pool session, and each one of those has got more than four steps, or has got loads of steps in it, can you imagine how tired their brain is gonna be trying to get, oh, there's Barclays Bank, oh yeah, we're not, no, what is the next thing we have to remember? Oh, it's McDonald's, isn't it? where all we really need to know is third on the right and it's on the left. That's, that's what we want to hear. So now, let's think about a typical in instructor that sits in front of students and he's given the briefing. What's the first thing that an instructor generally does in a swimming pool? He does. He goes, you watch me. Now, we just do that, don't we? We do it because everybody does it. Everybody's always done it. Now, why do we do that? How many times have you seen an instructor with two students looking at the instructor and the instructor says, you watch me? They are watching him. And in actual fact, if they're not watching him, it, it, it doesn't make sense to say you watch me because they can't see, can they? Because they, you know, they're not watching. <laughs> do you see what I mean? It's like, this is too much information, isn't it? This is like, you watch me. So, really, we just need to get on with it. And then other instructors, they do something else which I think is a bit crazy. They do something like, um, you watch me because now, and then they mime, we're going to do partial mask flood. So they mime what skill they're going to demonstrate. Now this would be okay if you're teaching the Alzheimer's class because we've just given a briefing, not, not, you know, not 10 seconds beforehand, what skill we're going to do. And then we come back underneath the water and then we demonstrate the skill. So third on the right, it's on the left. All they want to do is see you do the skill. If now we start asking other questions, then why do instructors say you watch me? And you're all instructors and probably you do you watch me because that's what you've been taught to do. That's what everybody does. Now, probably the reason that you do it isn't to do with the student at all. It's to do with you because you feel now you've been programmed that you can't actually go into it before you've done you watch me. In other words, it's your trigger to you watch me because now I know what I'm going to do. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's that. So what I'm suggesting is that you have something else. Steve is hotting up. So he takes off his jumper and reveals yet more inappropriate steps that should be left out of skills demonstrations. Now, what you've said is, if somebody isn't watching, then you would say, you watch me. So in other words, this is a corrective movement, okay? Now, and of course, if you need to do it as a corrective movement, then that's fine, okay, that's fine. I would say that's going to be sort of less than 1% of the time so you're underneath the water that somebody isn't watch, looking at you. But if in the case that they aren't, then you might need to get their attention so you watch me to, to, to do that. So I understand that. But now let's put it in the box it belongs in. So what's wrong is to do it blind. In actual fact, it's rude, isn't it? The first time you ever saw somebody say, you watch me, you probably thought that was a bit rude because I am watching you for a start. The degrees of rudeness can be, you know, We've seen instructors do that. I mean, I'm the one that's important here. You know, I, the spotlight's on me. And, you know, and this is the big problem, really. This is, um, we need to try and take that spotlight away from um, the instructor and onto the students. 
Now, if we think of it as a corrective movement, we now need to come back to the type of things that we were talking about yesterday in the classroom. In the classroom, we were talking about um, classroom teaching presentations. And with the PADI system the way it is, they talk about something called um, pres prescriptive teaching. You've heard those words, yeah. prescriptive yeah. teaching. And prescriptive teaching means, what does it mean? It means if uh, just teaching people what they don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, so this is what instructors do, isn't it? They, uh, in the classroom, every PADI instructor gets this. This is fine. We give them knowledge reviews. They, they have home study, independent study. They learn things. And what they don't know, then as an instructor, we correct that and teach that. There's no point in telling them things that they do know. We tell them things that they don't know. That's what an instructor's job is. And that is what prescriptive teaching is. And with knowledge development, everybody gets it. But when it comes to the pool, instructors don't get it. They say, you watch me, whether the people are looking at them or not. But when they're not looking at them, then you watch me would be appropriate because it's prescriptive teaching. Now, using the same um, ethos, we're going to actually go now into the demonstration a little bit more to find out what goes into the, into the demonstration. And I would suggest that in a demonstration, we don't put any corrective steps into a demonstration. We show the student how to do the skill, then we let them have a go and correct anything that they get wrong. But actually, that's not true. That's not true. I use another phrase here, instructors should stop teaching and allow students to learn. Allow them to learn. Now, so let's get something like a... Actually, I said I was going to talk to you which, uh, and say things that maybe you hadn't heard before. So have you heard this type of stuff before? No, no. And when I said that yesterday, you said, you asked me a question. You said, is this your thing or is this Paddy thing? Now, bizarrely, <laughs> bizarrely, it's never been anything different with Paddy. Pa if you have a look in the guide to teaching or any instructor manual that you've ever seen, the old one, the new one or anything, nothing is different from what I'm saying now. What's different is the way that the world does it. And I'd like to get my hands on the person who did it first because it spread like a cancer. And we, we just sort of see the, these uh, practices which are just passed on from one person to another and, and with no thought of what the student needs. Mm -hmm. Because everybody thinks they're doing it well because they're being judged by the scuba diving industry, but they're not being judged by the actual candidate who's paying the money to learn how to do the skill. So what I would suggest is like, what we all know um, for example, uh, you all instructors, anybody taught dive master courses? Anybody taught some? Yeah, okay. So, uh, but you've all done a dive master course as well. So, uh, okay, now there's no right or wrong answer to this really, but uh, just, just a feeling. If I was a, an instructor candidate on an IE or an IDC or your dive master on a dive master course, and I've been asked to demonstrate regulator recovery, and it, and it looks something like this, uh, we know that we can get a score of one, two, three, four, or five. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm the student now. I've got a regulator in my mouth, and uh, it looks something like um, so. How would that score on the between a one, two, three, two. four, or five? A two, you think? Yeah. Any, anybody? Is this for a student? I'm a dive master candidate and, and I'm doing a skill circuit and that's what I do. So uh, how are you going to score me as far as the demonstration is concerned? You can think of it, but... It's three. A three. Rachel says three. I say three. You say three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Possibly a two. Okay. It, it, it sort of can't be a two because um, cause you I, I did the skill. Yeah, I mean, to get a one, it's, uh, you, you, you just can't do it. Two is with difficulty. I didn't have any difficulty in doing it. I just did it, like an open water diver would do it. And that's a three. That's for sure it's a three. So that sort of gives us an idea about where the ballpark figure is. Now, to get a four, it needs to be demonstrative in a way. It needs to be slow. Okay, so let's just turn it into a four. That's 
four. Actually, that was close to a five. <laughs> because I exaggerated the, the breathing out thing. Okay, I'm talking about maybe bare minimums. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is think about what the student actually wants to see. Because they really... Do you remember the McDonald's? Do you remember the Barclays Bank? They really don't want to see too much more than, than, than that. So to turn it into a five, we need to put some extra signals in or extra exaggeration or extra bits in. Now the bits that we need to do, we need to now come back to our Dive Master course and learn about and remember how we learnt about attributes and critical attributes. So when there's a critical attribute with the regulator not in your mouth, what do you think a critical critical oh, attribute? Will blow bubbles. Yeah. Okay. So this is what goes into a briefing and this is what your student really wants to see and no more is Okay. When we come to briefing, we're going to find that the briefing mirrors that demonstration. Now, when we do see demonstrations, we see other instructors put other things into that demonstration. So, for example, what could be put into it that another instructor would put in that I'm going to start talking about cutting the crap, you know, but I'm going to call it crap. It's not that it's wrong, but let's work out why I think. So the regulator comes out of the mouth, we blow bubbles. Okay, okay. Now let's think about this one. Okay, so this now comes into like added steps. These are now corrective measures. Okay, this, why, why do we do this? Not to, yeah, to stop it free flowing in case it free flows. Now let's now think about it. If we're now going to allow our students to learn rather than to force teaching on them, which sort of doesn't work, because the only way that they're going to learn to remember is by doing it. Do we want, a if it's the first time they do the skill and they do this and they put it in this position and it free flows, what do you think that student likely is going to happen? Stop it themselves. I think that yeah. this is it. I mean, they know what, they know, they, they know how the regulator works. So if we think about, if we talk percentages, in your whole class, I would suggest that only 20% of people might do, do this. I mean, 80% of the people, they've seen it, they know, they've watched, in your demonstration, you'd probably do that, but not point it out. Now, actually, if somebody's got the tendency to let, the free, let it free flow, I'd want them to do it, because I think that the chances are that out of the 20% of people that are gonna free flow, 80% of those would do that. Now, that percentage of people, that'll be the last time they ever do that because they've, we've allowed them to learn. Okay, they've, they've got it now, that's fine. Now, out of the 20% of the people that went like that, the 20% of them that actually got a bit phased by it, guess what? With them, what do we do? Corrective teaching. We now can teach them in a prescriptive manner because they can't do it. We say, no, you put it in the down position. So instead of blanketing everything for such a small percentage of people, that can't learn from their mistakes that are actually going to make the mistake. Does it make sense? It's like you watch me to everybody when they're watching you, why would you ask them to watch you? If they're going to do this anyway, why tell them? We need to be prescriptively teaching people to allow them to learn. The same thing goes with, you know, instructors that sometimes they put the, or they've been taught to put the regulator behind them and then they do this with their arm and they go down here and they go over here and they do this. Um, they do all this. Um, but actually, when our regulator goes over our shoulder, we don't, we don't recover it by doing that, do we? We don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do it. We, we sort of do this, don't we? We just sort of do it. And now if we're going to come back to the students again, if somebody can't get the regulator and I'm in front of them, I, I just want to, I want to let them learn. Now, of course, all our students are, are different. And if we've got a student that's likely to panic, who's got a nervous one, yeah. clearly we teach people, we don't teach courses. We don't teach everybody the same, for sure. We're there for them. And, and so we would do different things for different people. But by and large, our Mr. Average student, if they take the regulator out their mouth and put it behind their shoulder, and you haven't done, you've, all you've done is recovered it, they, they know they've got to get it back. I mean, they're not that stupid. They know that they've got to find it, you know. So the regulator's in their mouth, and the first thing they do is nonchalantly is, is do this, and they've missed it. Now, if they're a confident, competent uh, student, what they're going to do now is go, blimey. And they're going to 
collect it. Again, that will be the last time that they ever won't get that on the first suite because they, they now know how they will learn. Now, yesterday we were talking about there are different types of learners. There's audio learners, visual learners, and kinesthetic learners, which is like the doing bit. Now, in the scuba diving industry, in the scuba divers, they're predominantly really kinesthetic people because they like doing things. I mean, it's like it's a sport that attracts people that likes to do things. So, briefings really, that's for the audio people, isn't it? The audio people are briefings. So the briefing is at best going to be listened to by a third of your class, but probably a lot less. The demonstration is the visual bit, which is going to be looked at by a third of your class. And the kinesthetic one, which is going to be the majority of the involve me bit, they, they need to, to get on and have a go. So we need to get there as quick as possible. So I'm suggesting that in our demonstrations, we don't add corrective steps into things that might possibly go wrong with some of the students. We actually allow them to correct their own mistakes. And the, the beauty of them going like that is that they will have learned using their own unique personal learning style. And no matter how much we want to force them to learn in a certain way, they can only learn in their own way. So this is a brilliant way of teaching because you can have six students and they can all have their own unique learning style. And if you allow them to learn using this manner, they will all use their own style to learn and correct themselves rather than the instructor forcing their personal learning style. So an audio instructor who learnt a lot by reading and listening to other people is very likely, unless he understands the system, is to just keep talking to people because that's the way that they learnt. But we need to judge people that the way they're going to learn. Does any of this make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, another thing that instructors often do is um, they put what not to do into, a, into their into their demonstration for their visual learners. Okay, their visual learners. What do you think a visual learner will learn by? Okay. <laughs> Can you see the seeds that's being sowed into the one percent, you know, the third of your class that's going to learn from your visual uh, demonstration is going to pick up, um, you know, holding your breath. So uh, there you go. So really, if a demonstration is to show people what to do, this doesn't ever belong in any demonstration because it's not to show people what not to do. Yeah. So does this sort of make sense? Absolutely. Okay, fine. Steve now goes on to tell them what signals are appropriate in a skills demonstration. There's only four types of skills, aren't there? There's one to do with a regulator. So what's the critical attribute with regulator? Bubbles. Mask. Nose. Okay. The third one would be buoyancy. There might be two types of critical steps with this one. What, what might be buoyancy? What might be that? Small bursts is good. Yeah, good. And another one? Breathing. Breathing. Okay. So these aren't necessarily corrective steps as such. They're more like critical attributes. So they would go into a demonstration. And the, the fourth type of uh, skill that we do would be more like a two-man, maybe a rescue skill. It's sort of in a category on its own. We'll leave Steve there to carry on with his lesson. I hope you've enjoyed his teaching style. If you want more, I suggest that you subscribe to Steve's YouTube channel. And if you are looking to do your Paddy IDC, then go to his website or drop him an email.